Good evening, everybody. It's lovely to to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about the question, what if the next 10 years felt like a revolution of the imagination? And why do we need to have such a thing? Well, we are currently in a climate and ecological emergency, which is moving much faster than most climate scientists had said. Uh, we are seeing things happening this summer that we weren't supposed to see happen for maybe 40, 50 years. Uh, the recent flooding uh, in Germany is just really a taste of, of what's to come unless we are really able to treat this as the emergency that it is. The idea that we can still address the climate emergency in small little incremental steps is completely uh, gone. As Naomi Klein says, there are no non-radical solutions left. The only things left are really radical. And the climate emergency means that we are not talking anymore about just changing to electric cars and maybe eating more organic carrots. It is a profound or a profound reimagining of every aspect of how we do everything. And what's important in that is that our imagination muscle should be like this. We need to be really building our imaginative capacity. The way I like to think about the challenge that we face is like this. And it's quite late in the day for a graph. So I'm not showing you this as a graph. I'm showing it to you as a story that I think if you imagine in 2021, uh, we are standing on top of a mountain in the global north and beneath our feet is more anxiety, more plastic, more carbon, more debt, more inequality than we have ever stood on top of before. And the guides who are at our side, who know this mountain really well are saying, we need to get down off this mountain. You can see the clouds that are coming. We have to get down. And for some people, that's enough, but not for a lot of people. And I wonder whether a better approach is instead to tell the stories about the valleys at the bottom of this mountain, to tell the stories about the delicious food and the amazing wine and the warm welcome and the dry socks and the comfortable beds that wait for us when we get to the bottom. And then this becomes the work of longing. How do we, as activists, as designers, as change makers, cultivate longing for a different future? Because that's the most, most precious thing that we can be doing right now. And the beautiful thing about the imagination is that the imagination thrives with limits. So my favorite definition of imagination is that it is the ability to see things as if they could be otherwise which is the superpower I think we need more than any other in 2021. If we cannot imagine anything other than how things are now, we will never create anything else. You cannot build what you cannot imagine. And the imagination loves limits. This book, which I'm sure you all know from your own childhood or your children's childhood, was written because Dr. Seuss was asked by his publisher to write a book that just used 50 words. And with those limits, he was able to write what he reckoned afterwards was his most imaginative book. So climate change imposes limits. But if we bring the right thinking to it, it unlocks huge imagination too. The challenge is that I think we live in a time where our imagination is in trouble. Uh, Mariame Kaba, an incredible activist who I love, she said, we live in a system that has been locked into a false sense of inevitability. Where are the people... Uh, in a, in our in the Ministry of Transport, for example, trying to imagine a world beyond cars and aeroplanes. If we don't create the space for those conversations, they don't happen. This was research published in 2010, which said that IQ and imagination rose together until about the mid 1990s, and then IQ continued to rise, and imagination started to fall. And when this was published, it was a big story in America. It made the front page of Newsweek magazine. People said, oh, what does this mean for economic growth? And what does this mean for Hollywood? No one ever said, what does this mean for the climate movement, for the social justice movement? We need to be cultivating the capacity to see things in a different way. So I worry 
that we will be the generation, the, the, the civilization whose epitaph on our gravestone will be really, it wasn't that hard. You know, we just had to imagine different ways of doing things and we get stuck and it very rapidly becomes too late. So how do we set about cultivating longing for a low carbon future? One way I think is with art. And this is an amazing artist called James Mackay at the University of Leeds who draws the future. This is his drawing of his city if it became the most biodiverse city in the world. If in 2021, the longing to do that was strong enough, where could they get to in 2030? They could get to this. And a picture like this helps you to almost imagine what such a world would smell like uh, and feel like and taste like. We see many cities now who are closing parts of the city to cars, making more space for gardens and for people. Uh, and in, in, in Barcelona, they're closing 30% of all the streets in the center of Barcelona. That makes a lot of space. What could we do with that space? Our children could walk to school through food gardens like this. This is completely achievable if we can cultivate the longing for that first. And as I said, one of the problems is that too often we get stuck thinking that the world we see today will always be like this. This is a street in London, Fleet Street, quite famous street in London. When you walk down a street like this, you think, well, it'll always be like this. Maybe the cars will change. They become electric cars, maybe. But this is a, a project called London National Park City created this little animation. They said, maybe this could become like this. And once you can start to see those spaces and their potential in radically different ways, then our imagination can really engage and start to see the opportunities of now and to get really excited about it rather than seeing a move towards a low carbon future as being a move away from something. It has to feel like a move towards something and has to excite our curiosity. This is a place I visited in France called Montsartu, where in Montsartu, the municipality were told by the French government that 20% of all the school meals had to be organic. So they said, well, if 20% is better than 0%, why are we only going to 20%? So the municipality bought this land. It was going to have housing built on it. They said, no, 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 we're going to buy it. And they turned it into a garden and they grow 70% of all the food for all of the schools in the area. They've changed how the food is cooked. Uh, it's been an amazing project for the local economy, for health, for education. They've seen a lot of it leading to a lot of unexpected behavior change with families at the school. 60% of families who before never bought organic food started to buy organic food. Many of the projects we need to do uh, uh, have so many, so many benefits in that way. So what I want to share with you this evening is something that we call the imagination sundial. And at the end, I will give you a link where you can download this. You don't need to be trying to read all the small writing uh, around the edge. This is our attempt, myself and uh, another Rob called Rob Shorter, to uh, answer the question, OK, it's 2021. We have a climate and ecological emergency. We need to see a revolution of the imagination. We need to cultivate longing on a big scale. Where do we start? What do we do? And I want to go through each of these four things and tell you some stories to bring them to life. So the first thing is imagination needs space. You all know in your own lives as designers, as people who are creative, that your most creative times come when you have space, not when you're anxious and stressed with deadlines. You need space. Albert Einstein always said his best ideas came when he rode his bicycle in the forest. And uh, this is in my community where we create space for the community to come together, to dream about the future, to ask what if, to think about where they want to go from here. We have to look at creating space and looking at uh, a universal basic income, for example, as being an imagination strategy because it gives people more space to be imaginative. This is a transition project in London where they took over an empty shop. They called it the a transition shop and they just invited people to come in they didn't sell them anything they just created a space for people to come in and talk about 
what they love, what do they fear about the future, what do they care about. So creating space is really, really important. The second one is place. And what I mean by place is a place that you go to where afterwards when you go home, you look at your home place and its possibilities in a very different way. This was uh, in April 2019 in London when Extinction Rebellion closed Waterloo Bridge for two weeks and they turned it into a forest. Normally this bridge is cars going backwards and forwards. My wife was there for, for two weeks. She was arrested three times. I'm very proud of her. And uh, they, th this bridge where normally people walk across lots of cars, the air is very dirty, people would stop and say, oh, why can't it be like this all the time? And once you've had a taste of that, it's very hard to, to not see the possibilities of that place in a very different way. This is in Houston in Texas. A friend of mine runs a project called Better Block. Nobody loves this place. And the, one of the dangers we have in 2021 is we build more and more places that nobody cares about. And then we wonder why people don't care anymore. So they go to this place. They speak to the people around here. They say, what do you love? What does this place need? And then they go back to their, to their workshop and they build things. And one day they arrive just when it's getting dark and they turn that place into this place. They fill that space with carnival and with, with, with coffee and conversation and food. They, I like to think of it as being like a, a pop-up tomorrow that they give people as an experience. This is an easier way to do that. Started in San Francisco called Parking Day. A group of artists came together. They said, where can we find affordable exhibition space? Not an easy thing to find in San Francisco. And then someone said, well, if you buy a ticket, for a car parking space. Is there a rule that says you have to put a car in it? Surely you could do anything. You, it's your space for the duration of the ticket. So they started a thing called Parking Day where once a year people come into the center of San Francisco, they buy a ticket and they turn the parking spaces into gardens, into libraries, into little cafes. Again, the kind of pop-up tomorrows that if we can help to give people a taste today of how the future could be, that's really powerful. Sometimes this is in, in Berlin, Princess Innengarten, one of the most exciting big urban agriculture projects in Europe, a big tourist attraction. Many people visit this every year and go away afterwards with their sense of what we can do with urban space really changed. And sometimes a place can be a whole town. This is an amazing place in France, in the northeast of France called Ungersheim, which is a, a, the, one of the best examples of transition. They have lots of renewable energy. They grow all the food for all the local schools. They have a local currency. They've created many, many jobs there. And there was a film that was made about Ungersheim called Qu'est-ce qu'on attend? or what are we waiting for, which was shown all over France and has inspired many, many other places. So the power of place to change people's sense of what's possible is really, really powerful. The third one is practices. And what I mean by practices is things that we do that expand our imagination collectively. So one of the th important things about imagination is that this is a part of your brain called the hippocampus, where your imagination and your memory both fire from. And we have to recognize that imagination to a degree is a function of privilege. That if our basic needs on Maslow's hierarchy of needs aren't met, it's very hard to live an imaginative life. The interesting thing about the hippocampus is that it is particularly vulnerable to cortisol. So anxiety, trauma, stress can make the hippocampus shrink and when that happens, we lose the ability to, to be imaginative about the future. So I wanted to try and find somewhere where they were rebuilding the hippocampus, maybe a, a campus for the hippocampus, if you like. And I went to Dundee in Scotland to an amazing project called Art Angel, run by Rosalie Somerton on the first floor of an office block in the city centre. They work with people who have stress and anxiety with working with the arts. They say, when you come here, you're not a patient, you're not a client, you're an artist. 
And every year they put on an exhibition in the biggest gallery in the center of Dundee. And so many people there told me their stories of how they had completely lost the future. And from coming here, the future was coming back for them. And every year to do their, to renew their funding, they ask all their artists to fill out a piece of paper which has two silhouettes of a human body. They say, fill the first one to show how you felt before you came here. The second one to show how you feel since you've been coming here. And I looked through a big pile of these. It was very moving. This is one that really, really touched me. Firstly, because for me, this really captures the power of the work they do at Art Angel. Secondly, this captures what it looks like when somebody's hippocampus begins to rebuild and we reconnect with our imagination. Having a healthy, vigorous imagination is, is a, an, an indicator of, of being in good health as human beings. And thirdly, for me, this is the image that gets me out of bed to do the work I do every morning because I don't know what it would feel like to live through a revolution of the imagination, but I imagine it would feel something like uh, like this picture. In terms of practices, this is one of thing uh, the, from the transition movement, an exercise called transition, any transition town anywhere. You need a big space, you need between 100 and 400 people. You start by imagining that you are traveling through time, you are arriving in a 2030 that's not paradise, but it's the result of us doing everything that we possibly could have done during that time. And then you think, what am I doing in that world? And then with everybody else, you build it literally with cardboard and bamboo and string and sticky tape and pens. And then you live in it and you trade in it. And it's absolutely amazing to be with 300 adults completely lost in a play world that they've created is amazing. The poet Rilke, once said, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens, which is so beautiful. I'll say it again. The future must enter into you a long time before it happens. And playing in this way can do that in a really unique way. This was the last time we did that. And these two young men, it might look to you like some chairs and some cardboard boxes. They have built the public transport system for Transition Town Anywhere. They can tell you everything about this, what color it is, what color the tickets are, what noise it makes. In their imagination, this is the public transport system. And that kind of imagination work is really powerful. And one of the great practices we need to get a lot better at is the ability to ask a really good what if question. So I just want to share two examples of really good what if questions from the Transition Town movement. This is in South London in Tooting, where they uh, there is nowhere in Tooting that is like uh, a town square or a village green, like a place for the people. But there is this place, which is normally full of buses. And so trans the, the, the transition group made all the buses go away for a day, and they turned that space into what it would be like if it was already a village green. They put real grass down on the ground. They filled it with coffee and music and carnival and conversation. I got to sit with my feet on the green grass uh, of Tooting on a hot July day. And what was so interesting to me was during the day, how people's sense of what's possible changed. At the beginning of the day, people said, if this was our village green, by the end, people said, when this is our village green, and people started to look at this wall and say, what story about ourselves will we paint on that wall? Something about asking the right question can unlock a huge amount of possibility. This is in Liège uh, in Belgium, where the transition group said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of the food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? The project is called the Liège Food Belt. And I went there about seven years ago when they launched this idea. And then I went back maybe four, four years later. And in that time, they've created 25 new cooperatives in Liège. They raised 5 million euro to start them, not from the banks, from the people of Liège investing into those businesses. They started a farm, two vineyards, a brewery. They now have four shops in the center of the city. 
I met the mayor of Liège who said, this is now the story of our city. We, our role as the municipality is just to get out of the way and to enable this to happen. So, uh, so for me, there's some, it was a beautiful example of something that started with a great what if question and is now leading to the transformation uh, of the food system of that city. And I've loved to see during COVID the number of communities using what if as a framing for thinking about where they want to go next. This is one community who produced these beautiful images, one every day. What if car parks became play parks? What if birdsong was so loud that you that you couldn't hear the traffic? Uh, I love this one. What if there was a daily imagination lesson? And by the end, the last one they posted was this, where they didn't even need to put all the words because people understood what they were doing. And this picture speaks to contentment and happiness and community and family and connection uh, in a way that, that, that really uh, uh, the imagination can lead us to. In London, in, uh, in Camden, who were the first municipality to declare a climate emergency, the first municipality <coughs> to run a citizens assembly on the climate, the municipality and the local community groups opened somewhere called Think and Do, which was like a, a community imagining space where all different groups from the community were invited to come and to raise their what if questions to think about what they would like, what's the future that they long for, and to tell stories from that future. And then they collected up lots of those stories to produce a version of their local newspaper from 2030, of people's stories of the 2030 uh, that they long for. So the last one that I want to share with you uh, is uh, is pacts, which is a strange word maybe to use with imagination. But uh, this is uh, a story from Bologna, where in Bologna, the municipality created something called a civic imagination office, not a civic participation office or a civic engagement office, a civic imagination office, where they created six laboratories around the city of Bologna who ran big visioning events, open space, future dreaming events. And at the end, when the community had come up with good ideas, the municipality would sit with them and say, that's a great idea. Let's make that happen. We can offer this and this and this. You can offer that. Good. Let's do it. And in the last five years in Bologna, they've made 500 pacts between the municipality and the community. Many people's experience with imagination is that occasionally, not often, that when our imagination is invited, then it tends to be humiliated, patronized, ignored. And we need to create a system where we invite the imagination and then we meet it in the middle and we can start to draw the imagination up uh, through society. So that's what I wanted to share with you, which is the imagination sundial. As I said, I will share a link where you can download this in more detail. And I just wanted to finish by, by talking a little bit about the transition movement. So the transition towns, there is a very good uh, national in Italy, Transition Italia, do a lot of work translating materials into Italian and supporting the transition movement in Italy. Uh, it is about what you can do where you are now and starting projects that give people a taste in 2021 of what 2030 could be if it was the revolution of the imagination that we discussed. And there's now 13, 14 years of experience and learning from that movement in 50 countries around the world, uh, which is very, very useful for anyone who wants to start working where they are uh, in their community. So just to finish, if you want to find out anything else about the work that I do, uh, the book uh, the book is translated into Italian. I think it's called Essi. No, that's in French. I can't remember what it's called in Italian. Uh, Imagina se. Uh, yeah, I think it's called Imagina. Yeah, Imagina. Uh, so all if you read that book and you like it, all of the hundred and something interviews that I did for the book are on the website in full, robhopkins.net. If you want to find out more about the transition movement, do have a look at the Transition Network's website. And also, if you enjoyed the book, 
uh, I do. I now do a podcast series called From What If to What Next, which comes out every two weeks where we explore a different what if question. And it's a really nice way of, of continuing that journey. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I didn't speak too fast or use lots of uh, complicated words. And I really look forward to your feedback and questions. Thank you.